Thank you, brother. You be seated. Sorry to keep you standing up singing so long, but I just met an old friend I haven't seen for years, right outside here, brother Noel Jones. We used to hunt together down in Arkansas. You heard me talk about it many times. The guy had lizard eyes that could shoot squirrels where I couldn't even see them. And um, so it just happened. I recognized him. He changed a little. And his grandfather now, but I was certainly happy to see him. Somebody told me, one of my field secretary, that at, at, um, there's another friend of mine in here tonight, an old friend, Brother Marston, from down around... Um, down around San Francisco. I wonder if Brother Marston would stand or hold his hand or something where I could. Mars, Brother Mars, bless you. I'm sure glad to see you again. God bless you. Oh, an old Bible teacher. <laughs> I remember, is that sister with you there? Yeah, well, I'm certainly glad to, to see you. Lord bless you. They were some of my first sponsors when I first come to the West Coast many, many years ago. Oh, this turned into be a homecoming week one. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're glad to have our brother and sister and brother Jones, sister Jones. And I remember about them years ago. I don't think he's in yet. He's at the back talking to some of them. We, he asked me, I've been about eight days and nights at the pulpit. He said, Brother Brandon, don't you like to hunt just a little bit? And I said, oh, I love it. He said, well, I'll take you hunting. And brother Johnson and I... So he had an old 97 shotgun. You man know what I'm talking about. The best ones was ever made. And then, um, so then, he had another old gun there that they had borrowed, which was just an old poke stop. You know, the old, the old gun. And every time he'd shoot a single barrel, he'd kick open, the, have to take a stick along with you, knock a shell out the back. And Brother Noel said to me, he said, Now, Brother Bram, you take this gun. I said, No, I can beat you any day with this year. He said, I'm telling you, you better take the gun. <laughs> so they turned the dog loose, and he run about 15 squirrels up the tree, and he barked. We started running over to where he's at. He said, now, if you want squirrels, this is your last opportunity. You better take this gun. I said, just keep moving. Well, that guy had about three squirrels on a fly. I never seen so much shooting in my life. Squirrels dropping everywhere. I shot once, and the old thing liked to kick me down. <laughs> I tried to knock them all out <laughs> We took Brother Johnson a couple days after that, and that was his father-in-law. And we had to walk across the, the uh, little bio of swamps as it is way over in Arkansas there. And he, so he had um, one pair of boots. So Brother Noel was the largest, tall, thin fellow, and he picked up uh, me and put me on his back, and across the swamp he went. He come back and got Brother Johnson, his little short, fat fellow, got out there, and I got the teeth, he got the last, and dropped Brother Johnson right in the middle of the water. <laughs> My, oh, God bless Brother Johnson. I, he just told me that he's very ill. So I pray that God Almighty will help Brother Johnson. That's his father in law. Oh, I tell you, uh, wherever I've roamed, some of the finest old hearts beats on them old blue shirts down in Arkansas, don't you? How many Arkies is here? Let's see your hand. Well, <laughs> all California's made out of is Oakies and Arkies, you tell me. <laughs> so. Well, that's mighty fine. Uh, mighty fine people in both Oklahoma and Arkansas. Frankly, everywhere you find God's people, they're fine people. Exactly right. Everywhere. We had a wonderful meeting this morning, a fine fellowship at the Full Gospel Businessman's Breakfast. I got there a little late, but got to enjoy some of the blessings of the Lord. The Lord came down and blessed us as I spoke on God's provided way to fellowship. And how that God seen us through the blood of his Son, and our red sins were white as snow. Now, tomorrow night, thanks be to ever who it was that changed that service from afternoon until night. Because it's certainly, I prayed for it. Now, we don't want to try to take meetings away from the churches. We try to have our meetings like this on the afternoon so that people can attend the churches in, at the... Uh, at their own service. But it, it would have been a scorcher for tomorrow afternoon. And so we are very happy that the ministers are tur turning out their churches and so forth to come to the meeting. Now, you visitors here in the morning, find you one of these fine churches here in the, the valley and attend it. 
wherever you see a good church, the church of your choice, the ministers, I guess, has already been introduced and so forth and told where they are from, take them some of those churches in the morning. And then, and, uh, help them, because they're dismissing their services, many of them tomorrow night, to attend this, this service here. God bless you, my brethren. That's a gallant thing. That's fine cooperation. I appreciate it. It's such things as that that brings to a man's heart and makes him want to return again somehow. To have fellowship, I trust that they'll be soul saved, that your churches will prosper, and whatever desire you have in your heart, may God grant it to you. You and you find people that give us this fine cooperation during these hot nights of this revival. Tomorrow afternoon, we aim, I promise, that everybody that comes to the meeting would have a prayer card. We had some nights of discernment. We try to pick up the cards afterwards. And then uh, everyone that attended wanted a prayer card could have one. And I'd pray for everybody had a prayer card. Everybody won't be prayed for. I sure do it. So we're going to try to do that tonight and tomorrow afternoon. So, uh, tomorrow night. The cards will be given out about an hour prior to the service. I'd say if it starts at 7.30, at 6.30. All that wants a prayer card, come at 6.30 and get it. The reason we do that, it's best for them to come to, as quick as they can to get the card, but we give a little space there because we don't want to interrupt the other services. Field Secretary, Brother Gold, Brother Mercer, and them has just announced to me that, of course, tomorrow... We'll be too late to get tapes or books. We have made it a habit of never selling on Sunday, especially these tapes and books and whatever they have. Now, those things do not belong to me. They're not mine. I do not get any money at all. I get a salary from my church, $100 a week. And so if we could just race up the highway to heaven like that, wouldn't we be doing something? <laughs> like those jalopy races going on out there, but I don't believe they can drown me out. I don't believe they can. We can just shout that down. If the walls of Jericho fell by some shouting, well, a little bit wouldn't hurt now, would it? Maybe the shackles would fall off. And so we are looking forward for tomorrow night being a great night. And now, the, as I said, I get a salary from my church, $100 a week, and all other money that's out of the campaign goes into the foundation, and then it's put aside so that it won't be for me or no one else. It's used for foreign missions. When I get enough money together, I can go over, I go preach to the heathen, them that don't even know who Jesus is. And in there, we have seen the greatest result, our greatest meeting. In Durban, South Africa, I've seen 30,000 blanket natives receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior in one altar call. 30,000. Bombay, India, for the Mohammeds, and that, it was hard telling. There's no way to number. There's estimated in the city to attend the meetings 500,000 people. We couldn't even place them nowhere. So many that I had to leave because we could find no ample place to put them. Expecting to go back soon where we go up to New Delhi, where the... the President, give us an ample theater that we can put a million people in it. An outdoor ample theater, panoramic of mountains. We're expecting great things there. And over there to those people who doesn't know, little black boys standing like that, never had a bath in their life, don't know which is right and left hand, or stand with their little tears running down their cheeks to hear one time of a story of a God that loves them. When you're doing that, my friend, I know we support our churches here at home. That's exactly right. But here where we've got big churches on every corner, big fine spires and everything, and them poor little fellows, Jesus died for them as soon as he died for your child and my child. He's just as hungry, he gets just as hungry as our children does. And it's not fair that we have everything, and even into glamour, and them poor little fellows never heard the gospel one time. I think it's our duty to take it, and if you can't do it, the offerings that you give in it and a love offering to me, is, I want you to know that I don't know if expenses is not made, I do not take a love offering. And if the expenses are not made, I have to stand and borrow the money myself to stand the expenses. We never leave a city on a penny. 
That's my record. And if it ever gets to a place where God doesn't sponsor my meetings and doesn't, doesn't pay it out, then it's time for me to come home and pass in the tabernacle again. I never took an offering in my life. I've always depended on God. I never would in my campaign let people beg, bum, and pull. If the people love God, poor people, they'll, they'll support all they can. And if they can't, then I'll have to I'll borrow it some other way from some friend of mine or something to pay it off. And then I, if they have it all paid up, and then free, I get a love offering. I don't even see it. My secretary takes it and gets it ready, and it's banked and put into the bank under the name of the Branham Tabernacle at New Albany, Indiana, and there that money cannot be used for nothing else but for the kingdom of God to support foreign missions as I go over to preach. And when I get enough built in there to go, then I take off and go. Uh, I believe that's just making the people know that what it is. These books that we got, they belong to Brother Gordon Lindsay. They're his. He writes them. We buy them from him at 40% less than what he, well, he sells them for. These boys are paid to sell these books. They're paid to transport them. Many of them are lost. Many of them are given away. We always in a hole on the books. The boys sell the tapes for the tabernacle. Now the tape is a copyrighted article, and they've got to be put on the very best of tape, like the book. If it isn't satisfactory, send it back. Get your money back. See? We, and then the, book, the tapes are sold real cheap. The records and anything that you buy, it's not mine. It belongs to others. We just put it in the meeting, and if I didn't think it wouldn't help you or help the cause, I certainly wouldn't let them be sold. And I search through it, see if there's anything wrong with the prices, compare them with others. And if there's anything that seems to be overcharging, right there, I'd stop that right now. Yes, sir. I don't have that. But tonight, if you want books or so forth, my life story, a prophet visits Africa, sermons as the eagle stirs its nest, do you fear cancer, many of the others, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, I'm not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Many of those books, if you want them, you, in records, tapes, you can obtain them at the end of the building here somewhere. Where's that at, Gene? Uh, back at the bank. There's a book confession, I guess, back there, that you can get them. Tonight only, for tomorrow, we won't sell them. Now, can you hear me all right, all the way back? Way back at the back. Oh, that's fine. Uh, let the engineer give this, this all the strength it's got, as long as you don't cause a transposition. Now, you love him with all your heart? Oh, that's just fine. My, I feel real religious to start with tonight. Here we want to read out of the book of Numbers. You are keeping down. The then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people chawed. In Kadesh, and, uh, wait a minute, I got my, wait, the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people chawed with Moses, and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of fig or of vine or of pomegranate. Neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went forth from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall Give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth them 
water out of the rock, so that so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. And now I want to take for a text out of there, an old scripture fell on my mind when I seen Brother Noel of a, a message that I used to speak on many, many years ago. Kind of forgotten most of it. What I used as a context, but I'm sure the Holy Spirit will reveal it to me as I go along. My subject is tonight, speak to the rock, and it shall give forth its waters. Give forth his water. You know, it's it shall give forth his water. It shall give forth his water. It must have been a hot morning. Everybody was all confused and flusterated because all night long the cattle had bawled and the, uh, the children had cried and the people had fussed and argued and quarreled. Poor Moses. It was a dreadful time for him. You see, he'd come down into Egypt and had brought the children out according to the promise of God and was leading them to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, with a promise of God to protect them and to supply everything they had need of until they reached this glorious land flowing with milk and honey. Moses, a God-called servant, Ordained prophet, pillar of fire over him, following him, confirming the words that he spoke by signs and wonders, on his road to the promised land with the children. A very definitely antitype, or type rather, of the journey today. We are on our road to the promised land. And we are being led by the great Holy Spirit. As they was led in the natural, we are led in the spiritual to this great promised land that God made the promise and gave to us. God had promised them to supply all their needs, but their carnal mind had taken them out of the divine will of God and had given them a desert route. That's a whole lot of it today. That's what's the matter with many of our churches. They've taken the carnal, intellectual route and it's been cut off the supplies of God's blessings of healing and power and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and have tucked the desert route. Therefore, we have arguments and fusses and stews and complaints. But those who are still remaining in the way, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory with God, with His pillar afar over them with power, with joy, with signs and wonders, how the real born-again church is moving on to the promised land, the promise of eternal life, a land flowing with eternal life, where there's no more sickness, death, sorrow, nor nothing to harm. Now, but when carnal minds begin to come among them, it finally drove them off the main path into the desert. They made their fatal mistake when they failed to go on. They were on their journey, not very many miles. They could have made it in a few days with all this two million people out into the desert if they had stayed on the path. But when they come to a place called Kadesh Barnea, Kadesh Barnea at one time, I'm told, was a great judgment seat. It says a great spring or well there. Many little wells, a perfect type of the church. The church is the judgment seat, where heaven is the great judgment seat of God, and the little wells represent the little churches all out, and judgment begins at the house of God. See? Here's where the judgment begins. That's why I don't see why so many complain that I speak too hard and try to uh, make people straighten up and tell them the way they're living, the way they're dressing, and tell me I'm hurting my ministry. When the judgment seat is the house of God. That's right. Here's where it's to begin at. Right here. Where justice and righteousness and judgment of God is to go forth from the pulpit. 
Now, when they got there, they camped. God had been good to them, showed them many great wonders and signs. Down in Egypt, on their journey, he had prepared everything for them. But still, they had to come to this place which was almost in sight of the promised land, just a little while after they had left. And when they got to this place, Moses took a man out of each tribe and sent him over into Canaan to spy out the land. We we're all acquainted with the story how they come to two of them up to uh, Jericho and how the harlot had hid the spies and so forth. And all, when they went into the land, they searched it out to see if they, the promise is right. When they returned back, they brought bunches of grapes that had taken two men to pack one bunch of grapes. I've often thought, if a land with a curse on it would grow that kind of grapes, what will it be when the curse is taken off? What a bunch of grapes it'll be. Oh, my. I, I, I just get a little foretaste of it once in a while. I was preaching here not long ago. I was thinking this morning. I do a lot of slobbering, you know, I guess, when I'm preaching. But I've been eating some of them grapes that's been brought back, and it kind of causes me to slobber a little, you know, like a horse eating clover. So then, when we... When they come back, they brought this great bunch of grapes, and they all gathered before the congregation of the Lord, and they brought a report, oh, God has told the truth. The land is flowing with milk and honey. It's a good land. It's a land of seed. It'll grow anything. Oh, it's a wonderful place. We've got plenty of water and rivers and irrigations and everything to make a great nation. But, oh, the, the Amorites and the Hatites and the, all the others are there. Some of them are giants, and we look like little grasshoppers. And when they begin to say that, oh, the strength left the children of Israel. They begin to cry and to scream. They had left Egypt and come up. All these things, and that had taken place. But there was two. Out of the whole twelve of them, there were two that had confidence. Rest of them said, we can't do it. We just can't go any farther. We're, it's impossible for us to meet that kind of people. But Caleb and Joshua said, we are more than able to take it. Why was it? The others, the one with the intellectual part, was looking at what the giants looked like. But Caleb and Joshua was looking at the promise that God had given. Now, it all depends on what you're looking at. There's people sitting here tonight that was in wheelchairs a night or two ago. They're up walking around now. It depends on what you look at. If you look at your affliction, you'll never go any farther. But if you look at the promise of God, you've got a right to every redemptive blessing that God promised in His Word is yours. Right. The Christian always looks at the unseen things. Every redemptive blessing of God is unseen. The, here's the whole armor of the Christian. Love, joy, faith, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, patience. It's all unseen forces that works in the heart of a believer. Amen. That's right. We look at things we do not see. If we're the children of Abraham, then we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. For Abraham walked by faith and called those saints which were not as though they were, because God said so. Now, Joshua had no way of knowing he could take that city. Caleb had no way of knowing it. But here's how they believed it, because God said, I have given you this land. I've got an angel that will go before you. My, take heed that you don't despise him, because my name is in him. He won't pardon your sins. He'll carry you across the, the fireplace. He'll ruffle up your feathers. He'll, he'll do things for you. But remember, follow him. He'll lead you to the promised land. But don't despise him. Don't reject him. Believe him. Now, and then we notice and in the journey, Joshua had found out that he'd seen that great God living there in that pillar of fire had performed all kinds of miracles. He and Caleb had seen that, and they had confidence that God would keep His Word. Watch God. Way down in Egypt, 
I've given you the land. Now go and possess it. God's given every sick person in here divine healing. Every one of you. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. It's yours. But you'll have to fight for every inch you possess. Everywhere the soles of your feet travels, God told Joshua, Joshua, I have given you. Footprint means possession. Let's move in tonight. Amen. Let's go in. Footprint is possession. Let's take every inch of ground that God gives us. If you haven't got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Peter said the promises unto you and to your children, to them that fall, even as the many as the Lord our God shall call. Footprint is possession. Let's go get it. Bars. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, let's possess it. The works that I do shall you also. Let's possess it. It's God's promise. Don't look at the circumstances. Don't look how hard it is. Let's possess the land. We'll have a meeting. Like this morning, we were having a meeting there, and the Holy Ghost falling into place, the people screaming, shouting, praising the Lord. And then someone come up and said, pray for me, Brother Random." I laid your hands on him and prayed for him. I said, now go and believe. Now, here's what it is. It's easy to feel the power of God, to see it when you believe. But then when it comes to the showdown, are you able to possess the thing that you profess to have? That's the thing, brother. We've got to get it. We've got to take it. It's ours, but you'll fight for every inch. Joshua fought every inch of ground from one end of the country to the other. But he had a promise. God said, I'll give it to you. Amen. Whether there's giants, whether there's atheists, whether there's infidels, whether there's cold farm or churches, what difference does it make? God give the promise. Let's take it. All right. It belongs to us. It's our possession. Let's go get it. Don't be afraid. Don't stay back and say, well, I believe the days of miracles is past. Oh, I don't know. Don't do that. That don't look like a child of Abraham. No matter how far along the promise seemed to hold out, well, it went on for 25 years. But instead of Abraham getting weaker, he got stronger all the time. For he know to be a greater miracle all the time. And we'll be prayed for one night, and the next morning we still got a bad stomach. We'll say, maybe I never got my healing. I have to go through the line again. Oh, you call yourself a child of Abraham. Hallelujah. If God made the promise, God gave the promise. And you believe it, I don't care what takes place, it's yours. Fight the devil on every ounce of ground he stands on, walk over and take it. Take the sword of the word. God's promises is true. Nothing can stop them. They're God's promises. He give us the promise of that just like he did the children of Israel. The Pentecostal church has come to their Kadesh Barnea. Are we able? Can we do it? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever, can we walk up there and take a hold of God's promise and say it's the truth? I claim it. I own it. It's mine. God gave it to me. How are you going to do it? I don't know. It's none of my business. Like I was preaching one time on Elijah, and a man told me at the service, he said, now, wait a minute, preacher. I believe that you're a more sane man than I actually believe that them crows bought Elijah fish and bread. I said, I believe it, every word of it, that the fish was fried and the bread was cooked. He said, how do you, Lord, tell me then, my friend. He was a Jehovah Witness. He said, tell me then, my friend, where did those crows get that fried fish and baked bread? I said, that's not for me to question. It wasn't Elijah to question. The only thing he knew when he got hungry, the crows were sitting there bringing him the bread and fish and he eat it. I said, that's the same thing about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I can't tell you where it comes from, how it gets there. I know it comes and I enjoy it. That's all I care about. I can't tell you how divine healing works. I can't tell you how a black cow can eat green grass and give white milk. But I drink it anyhow. I don't try to find the formula of it. I don't know what causes the Holy Ghost to fall in a meeting and people speak in tongues and prophesy. People jump up from the wheelchairs and sick get healed. I can't tell you that. Only thing I know, God promised it, and it's our possession. Let's take it and go with it. They can't explain how far it is to the moon or how many molecules is in the atom. That's none of their business. But the only thing they know, God promised it, they got it and enjoyed it. Amen. That's where they made their mistake. 
when they come to the judgment seat and brought back the evidence of a good land. I'm so glad that there was people years ago who approached through all the formalities and went up and possessed the land and got the evidence and come back that there's a land beyond the river. Amen! I'm so glad of that. Now, they made their fatal mistake when they began to murmur against Moses and against God's servant and against God and it bypassed them. And remember, every one of them that murmured never went over into the land. Jesus said when he was on earth, your fathers did eat men in the wilderness, but they are every one dead. Right. But I am the bread of life that comes from God out of heaven that a man can eat thereof and not die. Oh, I like that. Pass from death into life. Become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Carnality had cut off their spiritual supply. Carnality had cut off all their joy. Oh, and they begin murmuring and fussing. They chuck them off in the desert. If anything I hate is the desert. It's hot. There's nobody hardly can live there. And everything you get against in the desert has got stickers on it. Every kind of a little old vine got stickers on it. You know why? It's because there's no water there. Now, if that same little plant growed up in my country or up in a country that's got rain on it, that little plant would not be a sticker. That little sticker would unfold and it would be a nice tender leaf when it comes into a watered place. That's what's the matter with the churches. The reason they fuss and quarrel and stew and so-called Christians because they've been bypassed from the land of blessing, from the fountain that never runs dry, from the rock in the weary land. And they have become dry and carnal. You want to stick and say, days of miracles and say, that's a bunch of holy rollers. No such a thing as that. Oh, just let them come to the water one time. It is unfold and get tender and sweet and kind and humble. Something takes place when he put him in water. <laughs> I don't know why, but it happens that way. Oh, carnality had cut them off. Look, here's what they had done. They had left the garlic pots of Egypt. They eat angels' food and was complaining. Could you think of it? Yes, we see it. They had also, they had left the muddy waters of Egypt to drink from that spiritual rock. Still complaining about it. They had left the boasting physicians of Egypt that boasted how great they were to be with the great physician. That there wasn't even their clothes didn't get threadbare and there wasn't a feeble one among them when they come from the wilderness. Still complaining. And then they had left the they had also left the people that said the days of miracles is past to be with the people that's got signs following the believers. Now, isn't that just the same today? You come up out of that old coal farm or stuff, got the Holy Ghost, and God fills you with goodness, and you're drinking from that fountain that never runs dry, and all them things there, joy unspeakable and full of glory, and then go to complaining. It's just the same thing. First thing you know, you're bypassed off out into the desert. That's the way God does it. It's just that way. The, God doesn't do it. The people does it themselves. Their own carnal thinking does it. They had seen ten powerful miracles performed down in Egypt. Flies, life, fire, death angels. All they had seen in Egypt, all these great miracles that they had seen God do and were still carnal thinkers. And then they saw the Red Sea that was laying in the path of duty. They were on their road marching then, come out, there's a pillar of fire before them, and they marched on to the Red Sea, and when they got there, right in the line of duty laid an obstacle. And first thing you know, fear struck them, and they didn't know what to do. That's the way people does today. When fear strikes them, when they're right in the path of duty, listen, brother, let me say this. If you're walking in the light, having fellowship with God, with His people, and the Holy Spirit is up on you, and you meet an obstacle right in the path of duty, don't stop. Just keep pressing on. God will make a way through it. That's one of the greatest experiences of my life, is to see God. When I can't get over it, get under it, get around it, or anyway, God opens up a way and I go through it. Somehow or another, His grace is sufficient to carry us through it. Now they come to that and saw that Red Sea open, and they, what a great thing it was. How could they murmur? How could they complain after seeing those miracles? How can we complain today after seeing what we've seen? Great revival, healing campaigns, 
the Spirit of the Lord coming down, a deserter, the Bible said, the Word of God. And Jesus was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God crossed Himself, His own, to His calf. God, that created the earth, became earth and lived in earth. God who made flesh, become flesh, and lived in flesh. Oh, that ought to attract people. God could have come out of heaven with a full angel salute if He wanted to. God could have come down a, a full matured man. Angels on both sides, coming down the corner of heaven, sounding the trumpets of heaven. He, he could have done that. He could have come a full man, but he chose to come a baby. He could have been born in a palace. He could have been created in the heavens if he wanted to. But he chose to come not to even a bed to be born. He went to a manger on a manure pile. And over a manure pile, he chose to be born. It ought to be attractive. Jehovah crying like a baby. Jehovah playing like a boy. Jehovah toiling like a man. Oh, it's a great mystery. It's a super sign to the people. Everybody wanting signs. That's the greatest sign that God ever made when something comes fresh and brought among man. A super sign. Surely it would attract the people. But they get carnal, go away. Oh, yes, I guess that's all right. Oh, it's more than all right. It's God's protection. Working, making himself, crossing his chest. Making a tent and living in his tent, stretching out among us and living like we do. Amen. God. Here it is, but it don't attract attention. The church gets carnal, it bypasses, goes over, gets away from these great things. Now, we find that they'd already seen these miracles. Look what was with them. They had a smitten rock with them. They could drink from it. They had a brass serpent with them for healing. Oh, my. They had a, a prophet with them that had the word of God. Over the prophet was a pillar of fire that was doing the leading and not one time had it ever failing. Glory. Oh, I, I feel like shouting. Look, it hadn't failed. God doesn't fail. He cannot fail in his remaining God. He's still God. The smitten rock, the brass serpent, a prophet, an atonement. A sacrifice, everything grace had provided for them already. And after God had done all those things, they were like a lot of people today has to be babied around. God don't want babies. God wants men and women. I like old Buddy Robinson's testimony. He said, Lord, give me the backbone the size of a saw log. Put plenty of knowledge in the gable into my soul. Let me fight the devil as long as I got one tooth left and then gum over until I die. That's what we need. Courage. Not a wishbone, but a backbone. A real spirit-filled heart, filled with the Holy Ghost, sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Living in a life, walking in the path of God, keeping His commandments, claiming every promise is your own property. Hallelujah. Oh, I know I act crazy, but if you felt like I did, you'd act the same way. All right. Because it's good. Somebody said, boy, you've lost your mind. Uh, maybe I have. But if I have, just let me alone. I'm more happier this way than it was the other way. So just let me stay like this. I was walking through the city. I heard a man say one time that a man come down the street. He had a sign on his front of his breast like this way, like it was picketing somewhere. He said, I'm a fool for Christ. And on his back, after he passed by, I looked back and said, who fool are you? <laughs> so I just wonder now. I'm going to be a fool for Christ and know Him, know Him this, that I know Him in the power of His resurrection, that someday, when death takes me, that life's big channel sitting under my heart beats every minute, it goes towards that channel. But when I come to it, I don't want to come like a coward. I want to walk there and wrap myself in the ropes of His life, Jesus, knowing this, that I know Him in the power of His resurrection, that when He calls, I'll come out from among the dead. Leaving those things in the past, I'll catch the mark of the high holy. Glory! Yes, sir, brother. We need an old-time Pentecostal backwoods sin killing the revival of Texas, California, all other states and nations throughout the country. Bring back the power of God into the church again. We've come to a Kadesh, a judgment seat. All these things still fussing, still complaining, pillar of fire. Over the prophet, his words was perfect, smitten rock, bright serpent, miracles and signs they've done from it, 
then still complaining. Oh, uh, just uh, eating angel food and still a garlic. Want to go back to the old garlic pots. It showed they wasn't ready to go into Canaan. That's right. You know, someone said one time I was preaching, there's a woman crying. And she was just holding up her hands and crying, praising God. The Holy Spirit was there. The woman was filled with the Holy Ghost. How can a magnet draw anything unless it's magnetized to it? Correct. There was a man who belonged to another church, a friend of mine, was standing outside. He said, Billy, I was enjoying your sermon until that woman raised up and started crying. But how in the world could you preach and her acting like that? I said, that's the only time I can preach when I see that the power of God caught away the church, caught away the message. He said, it just made shivers run over my back. I said, if you'd ever be fortunate enough to get to heaven, you'd freeze to death. Because they are crying and shouting and praising God day and night. Angels flying back and forth, crying, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Holy. Now let me tell you something right now, my brother. You're living in the quietest world you ever live in. Amen. If you go to hell, there'll be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. If you go to heaven, there'll be hallelujahs and praise of God. Day and night for all time. This is the quietest place you ever lived in. Yes. Oh, how God wants to bless His church. They've seen all those things and still carnal mind. How quick they forgot all those miracles when a, a new a thing arose, when a new trial come on. They forgot all they had seen. We do that. We have a meeting. The power of God will fall. Great signs and wonders will take place. Then Satan can come along and smack something over on you. You forget that that's the God of heaven that was just making you shout, making you praise the Lord. You forget the God of heaven that brought you out of the, like a firebrand. You forget the God of heaven who dug you from the pit, from the rock from where you were dug from. Easy to forget him. Let me tell you, my brother, what we need tonight is a man with an iron conscience that will stand there in the power of the Holy Ghost. No matter what comes or goes, he's still waving that flag of victory going on to the promised land. We need tonight that kind of a church, that church unadulterated, sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, anointed with the Holy Ghost with signs and wonders, a shout of a, of a king in a camp, on their road, marching on. Yes, sir. All of this, in spite of all this carnal stuff that they had done, all desert, way over in the place, like the most of the churches are tonight. A lot of Pentecostal there. When the heavy burdens come and the people begin to cry, oh, we would to God that we had died down in Egypt. Now what happened? God called Moses and Aaron into the, His presence Come down in the Shekinah glory and bless them. God told the prophet, said, go speak to the rock. Amen. In the midst of all their sins, if God was wanting to put judgment up on us, there's none of us. But what has complained? We are worthy of going to hell. We are not worthy of our healing. We're not worthy of our salvation. But in the midst of all of it, that same God that forgave their sins, in all their doubtings, he still said, Speak to the rock, and it will bring forth his waters. Amen. That's right. No matter what took place, still speak to the rock. In their sins, still speak to the rock. Right in the day when the churches are all so in fussy and stewing, one that says, I'm this, and the other, I'm that, and one's this, that, and the other. Don't have enough to do with them and that. God, right in the midst of all of us, still sends his Holy Spirit, still sends his power. Still heals the sick, still shows the sign of the Messiah living among the people, the same yesterday, today, and forever, in the midst of our carnal quarreling. Look at them. Many of them said, well, now, if that's all you can do, here we are camped out in the desert. We've dug in every spring. We've dug on every oasis, and there's no water, and yet the very driest place in all the desert, that old rock went up on the hill. Go speak to the rock. How God does things. It just confuses the carnal mind. They just don't know what to do about it. Now, the driest place in the desert is the rock. Anybody knows that? Well, if, there's no, if they can't find any water in the old time springs, then how do they go to find it in the rock? If they can't find divine healing in the great church of this name, if there's any divine healing, it would be in this great church that we belong to, or it would be in this great church that we belong to, the old springs, 
How in the world are you going to find one now to go up there on top of the mountain and speak to that rock when there's no water up there to begin with? But the thing of it was, it isn't how it looks. It's taking God at His word. Speak anyhow. If the doctor turns you down and says that cancer is going to kill you, how would it be for a man to lay hands on you? Don't make any difference what it looks like, how foolish it looks to science. God said they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. No matter what it looks like. You mean in a day like this when we got all the culture and all the, all the uh, culture? I always thought of culture. Yeah, that, that's a great thing. Uh -huh. my, opinion, my opinion of culture is a man that hasn't got nerve enough to kill a rabbit, but can uh, eat a belly full of it if somebody else kills it. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, my. What we need today is not culture. What we need today is the Holy Ghost to bring faith in us to the Word of the living God. That's exactly right. In this great day of education, this great day of science, what does that mean to God? Why, well, the science one time built a, a great big tower was going to reach all the way into heaven, and God just sat and laughed at their ignorance. And the thing you've done is send a little tongues movement down there and confuse the whole thing. Oh, God can just do what He wants to, can't He? Oh, He's God. He's God forevermore. Certainly. Notice what's taking place here. Now, when we find that God told Aaron in the midst of all that him and Moses, go speak to the rock and it will bring forth His water. How foolish. That carnal mind. Well, if that's the best you can give me, just let it alone. Like Elijah, one day when he went to pray, and he sent his servant up to see uh, if there's any sign of a cloud. He went seventh time. When he came back, he said, oh, yes, there's a little cloud about the size of a man's hand over in the west over there. He said, roll up the rain barrel. I hear the sound of abundance of rain coming. What was it? Why, the, why the carnal mind would have caught that quickly and said, well, if that's the best you can give me, if that's all you can do... Oh, brother, how much more sign of that we got of the living God among us tonight. How we have. We've passed from death unto life. The baptism of the Holy Ghost has come upon us. Jesus heals us. Jesus saves us. Jesus fills us with the Holy Ghost. Jesus comes down and shows miracles. Discerns the heart. Does the sign. The pillar of fire. The picture's taken. It's here now. The same Jesus was yesterday. It's the same yesterday today and forever. Jesus said, when he was asked that you're a man yet 50 years old and say, you've seen Abraham? He said, before Abraham was, I am. And I am was that pillar of fire that led Moses to the wilderness. When he was on earth, he said, I came from God and I go to God. A little while and the world won't see me no more yet. You shall see me for I, I the first of man. I'll be with you to the end of the end of the world. Right. And when he died, buried, resurrected, about a few weeks later, Saul was on his road down to Damascus, and a great pillar of fire that led the children of Israel fell before him there, put his eyes out. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, and it's hard for you to kick against the priest. What was it? He come from God, dwelt in flesh, returned back to God. That same pillar of fire, that same Holy Ghost is with us tonight, doing the same work, the same time, the same everything else, proving that he is the same yesterday day forever. The woman can touch the hem of his garment. Oh, the man can be told who he is, what he's done, how to get out of it, all by the power of the living God that dwells among his people. Amen. All right. Let's speak to the rock. Let's look at some people who spoke to the rock. Let's find out what's taking place. The first man ever spoke to a rock was a man who got tied up in some theology. He made himself a set of fig leaves, Adam. He thought that'll do just as good as anything. But when he comes face to face with God, he found out he was naked. What did he do? He spoke to the rock, and the rock made a way of escape for him. The rock that was in Eden. There was Noah, another man, who had preached, and the people had ignored and laughed at him. One day he spoke to the rock, and the rock took him in the ark and took him away in his arms and rode him above the storms and drowned in the persecuting world. Yes, sir. Noah. There was a man named Daniel once who was in the lion's den. He went out into Babylon and he said in himself that he was not going to defile himself with the king's meat. He wasn't going to have anything to do with the world. Though he had to live among them people, but he wasn't going to defile himself. He purposed in his heart he wasn't. And one day the king showed him into the lion's pit 
because he was walking in the line of duty, but he spoke to the rock, and that pillar of fire come down and kept the lines off of him all night long because he spoke to the rock before he went to the pit. There was the Hebrew children who wouldn't bow down to the images of King Nebuchadnezzar, and they told him into the fiery furnace, and they spoke to the rock. And the fourth man was standing in the fiery furnace there, the rock of ages. Hallelujah! David said, if I make my bed in hell, he'll be there. I'll take wings in the morning and fly away. Notice, Hagar, she had been put out of her home. She had a little nursing boy, Ishmael. She went out into the desert, no place to go. The water had run out. What could she do? She had been raised in a home that was acquainted with the rock. And what did she do? She didn't want to see the baby die, so she tucked the little fellow and laid him under a tree and went off a bow shot and fell down on her knees, and she spoke to the rock, and the rock go forth his water, and that baby was saved, and to this day, while she was still standing there, that fountain, that the God who has seen me, she spoke to the rock for her dying baby. Can you speak to the rock tonight? Are you on speaking terms with him? Do you know anything about him? Joshua, he walked, come over Jordan. After he made that great decision, he stilled the people. They were able to take it. God said, Joshua, you're the one who knows all about it. I'll just let you lead the children from now on. He got over to his first campaign. He got up against the Jericho wall. He walked around and said, now how am I going to get over it? How am I going to ascend them walls? They got all those rocks and things up there, their bows and things ready to shoot. And here we are out here, mostly unarmed. Just what we picked up from the spoils across our journey. And there we are. How am I going to do it? And after a while, he saw a man standing with his sword drawn. He said, Who are you? Are you our enemy? Are you one of us? He said, Nay, I am the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua spoke to the rock. And a shout went out and the wall fell down. Because he spoke to the rock. Several hundred years later from then, there was an old blind beggar sitting on some of those stones that had fell from that wall. Oh my, the speaking of the rock have done been explained out of the church. There was no such a thing. But he was sitting there blind, thinking about it, on that road. When he noted Elisha and Elisha came down that same road, arm in arm, going to the Jordan. Just beyond there, Joshua had spoke to this great captain of the host of the Lord. He said, oh, if I would have lived in that day, I would have spoke to him too. And about that time, a noise began to come. You know, usually where God's at, there's a lot of noise. I don't know why it is. But there's a lot of noise wherever God comes. Here come that same captain of the host of the Lord. People tried to get him to shut up. But he spoke to the rock, and the rock gave him back his sight. He, they tried to make him shut up. They tried to hold his feet, sitting there shivering in his little bare legs, laying there in that sun in his little withered arms and, and his old ragged coat. But he throwed that coat one side to the other and took off the wall. He was ready to speak to the rock. And the rock gave him back his sight. Hallelujah. That's a warning to every blind man in here tonight. Whether you're spiritually blind or physically blind, speak to the rock. He's a sight giving rock. Amen. Speak to the rock. Yes, sir. The blind man, there was a woman one time, went out to the well to get some water. She was in bad shape. She's a prostitute. She seen a man sitting over there against the wall. And she didn't know who he was. After a while, he said, the woman, give me a drink. He went to talking to her until he found out what her trouble was. He said, go get your husband. She said, I have none. Well, he said, that's true. You've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. She said, sir, I perceive the dollar of the prophet. We know that there's a rock coming someday. Call him aside. And he'll do this. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. I can see her drop that water pot, her big pretty eyes shine into the city. She went knowing that she had spoke to the rock. Hallelujah. And she found water. She didn't come to that well to draw. Oh, she had spoke to the rock. With little Martha, one time her brother was dead and was buried four days out in the grave, rotten, already skin worms eating in his body. And she heard there was something in the city. And Jesus had come. She went out there where he was at. She fell down before him. And she said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask, God, God will give it to you. He said, Thy brother shall rise again. Why? Wow. She spoke to you tonight. Amen. And brought forth death out of corruption. And rebuked death and brought life. 
where a man had been dead four days, stood on his feet and lived again because she spake to the rock. The disciples one night was out on the sea. All hopes was gone. And what happened? They seen something. It looked like a spirit coming to them. And they found out it was the rock. And they spoke to the rock. New hopes come in and away they went. And the whole thing was spared because they spoke to the rock. Jairus, the little priest, his daughter's dead. All hopes is gone. Directly had to think of something. His wife saw him run and get his hat. Where are you going, Jairus? The doctor's leaving the house. He's pronounced her dead. Her heart stopped. She has no more respiration. Been sick for several days. Now she's gone. He said, where are you going now? What you got your hat? I just happened to think. I'm going out to speak to the rock. And the rock brought forth life again into his daughter. Hallelujah. That's our God. If you need life, speak to the rock. If you need joy, speak to the rock. If you need healing, speak to the rock. If you need the Holy Ghost, speak to the rock. Whatever you need, speak to the rock and he'll bring forth his waters. Do you believe that? What the church needs tonight is get back on speaking in terms with the rock. The rock of ages. Christ Jesus. God's smitten rock. That's God's rock. Is the salvation of God. That's still our commandment tonight. Is whatever we have need of, speak to the rock and use the name of the rock and God will bring forth His waters out of that rock. Sorry! I feel like I could run a hundred miles. Fine. Oh, brother, I know that smitten rock. Playing right here now. Don't smite it anymore. Just speak to it. Just speak to the rock and it'll bring forth His waters. You believe that? Let's bow our heads and speak to you, man. Whatever you have need of, speak to that rock and see if he'll bring forth his water. Oh, God, have mercy. We know that thou art the rock in a weary land. You're a shelter in a time of storm. No wonder Jesus said, if they hold their peace, this rock will immediately cry out. The rock. John said, God's able these rocks to rise up children unto Abraham. God, how we thank you that we could speak to you. We're so thankful to be on speaking terms. The blood of Jesus Christ touched us in this condition. I pray, Father, that you forgive every sin of the people in here. Take us all together tonight, Father. Forgive our sins. Heal our sicknesses. May the Lord God of heaven show forth his power and his glory upon this people while we have our heads bowed. I wonder if there's one in here That doesn't know him and like to speak to him for as your Savior. Would you raise your hand? Say, Lord God, have mercy upon me and give unto me eternal life. Uh, will you raise your hand? God bless you, sir. Will there be another? God bless you, lady. Will there be another? Someone else, God bless you back there, uh, sister. Another say, I like to speak to the rock, Brother Branham. Do you know him? Yes, I know him. I'm acquainted with him. He's my friend. He's my Savior. I spoke to him 31 years ago. He forgave all my sins. He's healed all my diseases. He gives me peace and satisfaction. Would you like for me to speak to him for you? If you'd like to know him too, someone else raise your hand and say, I, Brother Branham, would like to know him. Just raise your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. I'll certainly do it. Lord bless you. Would there be another before we close? God bless you back there, sir. Uh, that's good. That's real conviction. God bless you over here, sir, to my left. God bless you, the little fellow back there, the little boy. God be with you, sonny. Make a preacher out of you. Somebody else said, I'd like to speak to the rock. All right. No one else? God bless you back there. I've seen your hand just then. I'm just waiting for a moment to see if there'll be someone else. Think of it now. Are you in the desert? Don't you know where to go? Have you been, got off the real beaten path? Why not speak to the rock? He'll bring forth his water. That smitten rock was Moses' judgment rod. The judgment rod of God smote the rock and it had a cleft in it. And out of that same rock they found honey one day. Oh my. God's judgment smote Jesus Christ who was the rock of our salvation. There's a cleft in his side. Honey is in the rock, as we said this morning. They find food. You find shelter in a time of storm. You find healing for your body. You find God bless this young girl sitting here. Find whatever you have need of. It's in the rock. Would you just 
Believe him now with all your heart. All right, with the, I got your hand back there again. I'm just waiting, waiting to see what the Holy Spirit will say. All right, if thou can believe. All right, our Heavenly Father, you see their hands. They want to speak with you. I bring them into your presence, Lord. May this be the night. God, tomorrow may be too late. That we may not, none of us, be here tomorrow. How do we know that the great thing isn't going on now to start the world? To blow it up. How do we know that a missile won't get loose somewhere and will cause the firing to start? When that time starts, the church will be on its road to glory. Oh, God, it will be taken up in a cross Jordan, Jordan of death, and will go into glory. Let your presence be known to these people tonight, Father. Let them know that this one that they've raised their hands to is still the same Lord God. He does not change. People change. His time changes. But God changes not. Come up here. And one of the ministers here, the brethren, sometimes in these healing services, I get so weak I can't even see where I'm standing. And my son or Leo or Jean or some of them will come hit me on the sides and take me out. It's because those visions just make me so weak I can't hardly stand here. See? And that's the reason I think it's more sufficient. And I'm trusting you, brother, you, sister, you that raised your hand, you that don't know God. It's your salvation. God's already saved me. But I just couldn't be satisfied unless you're saved. I want you to go too. I want you to be there. Now, God doesn't, God doesn't do things. Just, if I could stand tonight and say, I'll tell you who will be president and tell you just exactly, and it would be that way. Well, that's why you say, Brother Bram's a great prophet. Sure. He told exactly who would be president. But you know what? What good would it do? See? It wouldn't glorify God any. That would glorify me. See? So God doesn't do those things like that. God doesn't do it. He just does things for his glory. He, he lets the prophet enter into such a place that even the prophet sometimes thinks it's himself. Like David in the 22nd Psalm cried, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? The very words that Jesus said at the cross. What was it? The Spirit of Christ in him had him anointed. And he spoke the words of Christ. Look at, the, at Isaiah, how he spoke. And thought it was he, the Messiah, was so in him. Look at David going up over the mountain, look back over Jerusalem, weeping as a rejected king. Just a few hundred years after that, the son of David went up, a rejected king, looking back over Jerusalem, weeping. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have hovered you, as the hen does her brood, but you would not. Think of it. Now, that's the Spirit of God. Now, God uses his prophets to glorify him. Do you believe that? Now, in the line, here tonight, I do not claim to be uh, any healer. I'm not a healer. God is a healer. All that God can do for you, he's already done. Now, the next thing you have to do is to have faith to accept what he's done. He's given you the promise. He wants you to enter in. Now, how many believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Thank you. How many knows that he's the high priest right now that could be touched by the feeling of our infirmity? How would you know you touched him if you touched him? Well, he, how would that high priest act? The same as he did yesterday. Is that right? He'd be the same. If you could touch him from where you are right now and touch the board of his garment... Then if he's the same yesterday and forever, he'd turn right back around with his spirit and do the same thing he did to that woman that touched him. Is that right? He looked out over until he found who she was. There's great crowds of people that are touching him. But he looked over that audience until he found who she was. He said, thy faith has saved thee. Your blood issue's gone. See? He knew it. Now, what did it? She touched the high priest. You can do the same thing tonight if he's the same high priest. If it's the same pillar of fire, if this picture we got here, I sometimes have him laying here, but the picture of the angel of the Lord, if that's the same angel of the Lord, he'll do the same thing. If he's the same yesterday day and forever, he'll produce his life. Say, how many feels the presence of God? It's just tearing me to pieces here on this platform. <laughs> that's right, friend. I don't even, I believe we don't even have to have a prayer line. How many believe that God can call you right out there, whoever you are, and he can help? Without a prayer line. If you believe with all your heart, God will do it. All right? Will you believe if he'll do it? Will you believe him, accept him? All right? How many sick in here? Raise up your hand. How many wants God in your life for healing? Raise up your hand. Now, how many of you strangers to me raise up your hands? And I don't know nothing about you. Raise up your hands. All right? All right? Now you pray. You, don't, you pray to the high priest and touch his garment. See what happens. Oh, if he'll do this, I don't know he will. I'm, I'm trusting that he'll do it. 
I believe the anointing, that same pillar of fire, is here tonight. I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. He said, he told me, he told me that it would, it would happen. I believe him with all my heart. I believe him. Satan, you might as well get away because I do not listen to any of your scum. I believe Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His Bible promised it, and he's the same. People can touch him. Lord God, let it be proven tonight. Let the Holy Ghost prove it, that you are the same Lord Jesus, that you can be touched. Grant it, Lord. Use your humble servant. Lord God, speak to the people through me. If you can use my voice, here I am, Lord. If you can use their faith, speak, Lord, that might encourage others. Let someone touch you, Lord, so that they know that you're the same rock of ages. You're the same rock that will give forth its waters just as soon as you speak to it. For it's a high priest now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Grant it, Lord. Let it be in Jesus' name. Just believe me. Just enter in reverently and believe me. I can't do it. It's your, your faith has to do it. Just have faith humbly. Don't press. Don't press. Just relax. Say, yes, Lord. I believe you. I'm coming to you, Lord. That man doesn't know me. How would he know me? He's a stranger to me. Now, I know he's preaching the truth because here it is in the Bible. I know that's true. But now, if you have honored your people by sending a gift among us, then, Lord, let me have the benefits of it. Or if I don't need it, if you don't need healing, say, Lord, touch somebody in here that's praying. Say that. If you don't need healing, let somebody else. Just a few hands went up that needed healing. I don't know who they were. But if you don't need it, you, you, you pray for somebody else that does need it. Say, I know somebody here that needs healing. Let the Holy Spirit speak to that man and call that person. Just believe it like that and see what happens. Oh, isn't this a great time? Here it is. No matter what I say, if God don't keep his word, he isn't God. Now, there's no other religion can make that stand. Our Jesus is not dead. He died, true, but he raised again. He's alive forevermore. Thanks be to the living God. Here, as you might know, there's a little lady sitting right here. Don't know her, never seen her in my life. But the woman's suffering from a hernia condition. That's right, isn't it, lady? You had more faith than they thought you had, didn't you? If that's right, raise up your hand, lady. Way up so the people can see. There it is. What did she touch the high? I say another thing. That woman's not from here. She's from another city. You can. You believe with all your heart? That's exactly true. You can go home and be made well. For Jesus Christ makes you well. Amen. What did she touch? Ask her if she ever know me. I have no way of knowing you. But what was it? Look at there. Can she see that light still hanging on that woman right there? Look at that light. Right there. There's another lady that goes over right back behind her there. Right back in this way. She's suffering with a female trouble. Miss Haggie, you believe with all your heart that God... That's right. That's who you are. I'm a stranger to you. You're suffering with that disease, sitting there praying. If that's right, raise up your hand so the people will see. There she is. What did she touch? She touched the barter of his garment. Not my garment. She's 30 yards away from me. She touched the barter of the high priest's garment. Do you love him? Amen. Have faith. Believe God. Somebody in this section, believe. Here. Here sits a man sitting here looking at me. A man's got a dark spirit over him. He's got epilepsy. You believe that God will heal you? Make you well? You suffer with them falling uh, epilepsy. You believe God will heal you and make you well? If you do, raise up your hand and say, I accept it. Go home and may the devil leave you and never bother you again. In the name of Jesus Christ. Here, I see another woman. She's sitting right back here. She's suffering with a thyroid trouble. She's bowing her head. She was praying. She is praying, Lord Jesus, 
Let him call me. She touched the hem of his garment. Oh, God, don't let her miss it. Please don't. Her name's Miss Strait. All right, believe Mrs. Strait and go home and be well. Do you believe with all your heart? You do? Stand up to your feet and witness that you believe that God will make you well. All right. If you're a stranger to me, raise up your hand. All right. But you're not a stranger to Christ. If that isn't the same Lord Jesus, I don't know what is. Amen. Do you believe with all your heart? If thou canst believe. I see a lady sitting right back through this way. She's suffering. She's got oppression. She's got a breakdown. It's a nervous condition, a mental condition. Oh, if the woman could only catch it. God, tell me who she is. Please do. Her name is Mrs. Adams. Miss Adams, believe with all your heart in Jesus Christ will make you well. Do you believe it with all your heart? You accept your healing? Don't be scared. If you're scared, you'll always be in that estate. It's a mental oppression. But don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. Will you do it? Then stand up on your feet, Miss Adams. Stand up on your feet. Stand up right here. And be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke that devil that's bothering you to try to keep you from it. The devil's a lying to you. You're going to be all right. Go home and be well now. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a man right back behind her there, sitting on the end, suffering with heart trouble. Mister, do you believe it? Have you got a prayer card, mister? You believe God will heal you? You got heart trouble. You was healed right then. Jesus Christ made you well. You touched the border of his garment. He's praying for you. Amen. I challenge you to believe it. Here, here's a woman sitting right down, right down in this way. She's suffering with hemorrhoids. Oh, God, tell me. Let me know. Mrs. Hootenpow, stand up on your feet and accept your healing and be made well in the name of Jesus Christ. I challenge this audience to speak to the rock. Do you believe him with all your heart? How many in your breeds you are speaking terms with you now? All right. Can you speak to him? Then put your hands over on one another. Lay your hands on one another. That's it. Just forget yourself. Speak to the rock. Put your hands on one another and offer a word of prayer. God heal you. Heavenly Father, I pray thee in Jesus' name. Send down the Holy Ghost and may they speak to the rock. And the rock bring forth this waters of healing and strength and power, joy and love and forgiveness of sins. Grant it, Lord. I commit them to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Speak to the rock. And the rock will bring forth its healing powers. Do you believe that you're speaking to the rock? Everyone accept your healing now. Stand on your feet. Rise to your feet. That's it. Amen. Hallelujah. Speak to the rock. Now let's raise your hands and praise the rock. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your power, your omnipotence. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We speak to the rock, and the rock bring forth its waters. The same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. Your words can never fail. These people are yours, Lord. They love you. They are praising you. Lord, grant sinners to come to the altar of repentance. Grant it, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, how many of you accept him? Raise your hands out. I believe he's in our midst of us. Raise up your hands. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. How glorious. How marvelous. There's not nothing else can be done. I don't know nothing else to do now. He's already done it. There's no need of calling a prayer line. The Lord's already here. The Lord's already speaking. Hallelujah. Just believe the rock. And the rock will bring forth these waters. I command you to the rock of ages. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.